So this is the uh, the first of two sessions, this and next week, uh, in which I'm going to cover a, a large number of the poems. Um, not in massive depth. What I'm going for is uh, this idea of advancing yourself in a perceptive interpretation. So I'm going to take them and I'm going to look at, I'm going to just assume that you know these poems very, very well uh, and you've been through them and you understand them, whatever. I'm just going to go into things, that, again, you may well have covered before, but the things that I think are what would take you forward into that kind of level five, moving to level six uh, uh, response. Now, you know, Bear in mind, this is um, one of the uh, sections of the exam that I mark uh, and have marked for a number of years uh, and team lead on. Um, and so what I see with power and conflict responses quite often is uh, a couple of things. First of all, I see people who don't tend to answer the question, uh, people who tend to write down whatever they know about the poems. I think it's partly because they're intimidated by the poetry. Uh, and they think, you know, they've sat there and they've learned because it's short. Some of them in other schools have sat there with a copy of it up and copy down the notes and, you know, that kind of idea. Others um, take themselves uh, online and, and, and look at certain people who I'm not going to mention who do uh, not particularly great videos that give you only one way of interpreting things. Um, and we tend to get the same things come up over and over again. What makes a difference is when you see people who fully understand and have an interesting interpretation of poems and not an interpretation they've been told and taught, but an interpretation that they have built based on a fully complex understanding of the poems. So I'm going to take uh, the poems up until the first half of them, up until the end of Storm on the Island this week. Uh, I'm not going to deal with every single one, but I'm going to deal with a number of them. Uh, and we're just going to try and get through uh, and I'm just going to try and focus you on some of the things that might take these poems a little bit further. So I'm going to start at the beginning. I'm going to start with Ozymandias. Um, often a favourite. People often feel very comfortable with Ozymandias and want to use it. It's a very good poem to be able to use. I would be surprised if it comes up as the printed um, poem on the paper this year. But I think it's a very, very good poem to know very well, to know inside out for your um, secondary poem, if you like, the one that you choose to compare, particularly if you're dealing with things like the power of nature. But there are other powers in here, as well as the power of nature and the power of humans. We always think about the idea with this is that Ozymandias himself is someone who takes his power too far, who... Uh, thinks he's hugely important, as he is in the time that he is, shows it all off, and then what we see is that time has destroyed him. We're all comfortable with that. But if his work doesn't last, we've still got a lot of stuff there. We've still got things in the desert. We've still got the legs. We've still got the pedestal. We've still got the head. Whose work is lasting? Well, it comes around to this. I think I may have briefly mentioned this uh, a previous time we looked at this. One way of looking at Ozymandias is that it is about humans who do have power and that those humans are artists. Now, it's always going to be a popular thing for a poet, who, of course, is an artist, to praise artists and to say their work lasts. But I go to these lines here. When he's talking about the head, that he sees bear in the desert. Remember, the person who's talking is a traveler from an antique land. It is somebody who has experience of this, somebody who knows things, somebody who's been places. And when he looks at that face, he doesn't think of Ozymandias. He doesn't, when he sees the frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command, he doesn't stop and think, oh, this is um, somebody who uh, has had huge amounts of power. Look at how he wanted himself to be thought of. Look at all that. He doesn't. He looks at it and he thinks of the sculptor. He thinks, my God, that sculptor was good. And so what we get is a poem that deals with the impact of the artist. The sculptor's name isn't remembered. Nobody knows who it is. 
but his work is, and his work outlasts anything that Ozymandias had at the time. It's a similar theme that comes through in My Last Duchess as well, where we get this Duke proclaiming his power and how he could have this woman executed like that. But this painting of hers is going to endure long, long past him. And so are the mysteries of it. And so she will eventually win. So I think the question it raises, therefore, if nature has the power and artists have the power, are artists the humans who are in sympathy with nature? That's, I think, something we can certainly take from Shelley there. OK. So power of nature, power of time, power of the artist. Now, moving on to uh, London. The next one across here, again, one that almost certainly will not come up as the named poem uh, printed on the page. It came up uh, two years ago, I think. As an outside chance, they will, because, of course, that was a COVID year. So very few people sat the exam. They may use it again. But it isn't a bad one to have as a secondary poem there ready. It's very good, particularly in terms of the power of powerful emotions. I think that's often it. OK, if it's a question on itself, it's, all, it's usually going to be about place. But I think the power of his emotions is something very, very important here. And I'm going to focus you in here on, again, something that will take you above most others, which is understanding the poem as a poem, not just as a collection of words and phrases and then random terms that you've been told. This is seen that London, as with much of Blake's poetry, is about the power of sound. Blake always use sound. I mean, his poems, very much like this, often sound like they're really, really simple. Yet underneath, they have these incredibly complex and obscure images. That's something that Blake always did. Very, very simple on the surface, very complex underneath. It sounds almost like a nursery rhyme until you look closer. But sound is right at the heart of this poem. First of all, I'm going to take uh, here a sense of um, particular words that deal with sound that come all the way through. And this is an interesting thing, because remember, the premise of the poem is that he's wandering the streets of London. Wandering through. So why isn't he wandering through seeing these things? Because he isn't, because past marking every face in me, marks of weakness, marks of woe. Past that, everything is sound. He's talking about what he hears. Even when he talks about the mind-forged manacles, people who are walking around with kind of, um, you know, chains around their wrists, stopping them from acting and doing things that they've created in their own minds. He says he hears them. He doesn't see them. He hears it. He hears it in their voices. Well, he then moves on into the second half to deal with the individual people, the victims of this kind of awful London that we've got. The chimney sweep, the soldier, uh, the youthful harlot. It's all about the sounds that they make. The sweepers cry, the soldiers sigh, the harlots curse. And when you look, that becomes even more complex. Because it's the sound of the chimney sweeper, the sound of their agony that creates uh, 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 the horror, the terror of, of, of how the church is ignoring it. And then the sigh of the soldier runs in blood. One of his complex images that doesn't, you know, on the surface of it make any sense at all. How can a sigh run down in blood? But of course, he's not going for realism here. It's the sound that he's going for again. And it can't be realistic because he's not really saying, I walk around and I hear this soldier going, ah, is he? Right? It's a sense of the sound of the city around him that's showing that these soldiers, this person who's there to protect, is going to end up, if there's some kind of revolution, he's going to end up slaughtered and the walls will remain with the people behind it. And when it gets to the youthful harlot at the end, it's not just that she's cursing. 
it's that idea that again he hears doesn't witness he hears the curse of this harlot giving birth so she is creating new life and the first sound that this infant hears is a curse blasting it the ultimate image of innocence corrupted in its immediate moment of birth because of what London is. You can also see how the sounds words get uh, um, more and more intense all the way through, okay? And more and more of them as we go through. So think about how that changes the meaning of the poem, that this is all about him walking through the streets and hearing this. Does it mean that he can't see this because it's under the surface? All he can do is if he listens out for it, if he really pays attention, that's when he sees the reality underneath. And the sound goes further. If you start to look at it as it moves through, look at the uh, the quality of sounds, the, um, the actual, uh, oh, what's the phrase for the sound that you have? Um, the, the, certainly the, uh, uh, the intensity of the sound that comes as it goes further. It, it becomes more and more harsh as it goes through. Look at the beginning when he's first of all wandering. Look at those big open sounds that he's using. I wander through each chartered street, you know, where the chartered Thames does flow. Big, long vowel sounds without much in the way of consonant. It's calm. It's gentle. It fits the kind of like chartered environment, the pleasant place he's in. As it moves into the second stanza, we start to get those harsher sounds. Whereas we just had chis and muz or whatever in there, here we get the k coming in of the cry being repeated. The man, the mind forged manacles. And even though we had the M's here, because we have not got those long vowel sounds afterwards, we get that sense of uh, M's are uh, um, what are called plosive sounds, like your mouth going Muh, like that. So we're getting that harsher sound as though as he begins to hear these issues, he begins to experience these manacles that everybody has forged. His anger is increasing and it's coming in his sound of his words. <laughs> Before he moves on to a harsher, almost spitting sound. Ch the sibilance there, chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldiers sigh. He's hissing almost as it's beginning to boil to the surface and then explodes in the final one. Most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blast the newborn infant's tear and blight with plagues the marriage hearse. The repetition of the plosive M and the plosive bl coming out here. Blast, born, blight, and even plagues, which has virtually the same sound. Bl, bl. The hard-hitting H's all the way through. It's quite deliberate. His sound of the way he's speaking is also going and getting across his anger, his frustration as it goes through. And if you use it a second, you poem, easy things to remember, okay, and easy things to comment on. You don't need massive individual uh, um, remembered examples. You talk about the technique and how it's working and impact. So plenty with that one. The prelude, to me, I, I would doubt your thinking of using it as a secondary poem, as a, one of your own choice, but it hasn't come up yet and there's always a chance it comes as a primary poem. If it does, the key thing for me here is the ending. I've seen the prelude talked about before in exam answers. People tend to focus entirely on the kind of mountain story. You know, they focus on the idea of always oh, look, he goes out on this calm, peaceful lake and then he sees this and then he gets all very dark and uh, everything goes beyond there. But the ending, as with several of these poems, changes or certainly develops the meaning totally. OK, from this point onwards, which is line 34 in your anthologies. This is the consequence for him. After I had seen that spectacle for many days, my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. 
Oh, are my thoughts there hung a darkness? Call it solitude or blank desertion. No familiar shapes remained, no pleasant images of trees, of sea or sky, no colours of green fields, but huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men, moved slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams. Now, you can see why a lot of people just ignore that bit at the end and think, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever, right? Or look at it on a very basic level. But for me, this turns this into, well, what the prelude is. Remember, the prelude, as, a, as it is a, uh, um, a verse novel, basically, uh, a verse autobiograph autobiography, is about his early life. And therefore, it's about the forming of his character. And that's what this is about. OK, he stole a boat. OK, he went out. OK, he saw a mountain. OK, he came back. What's the difference? What's he learned? Well, what he's learned here, first of all, isn't clear. His understanding that modes of being, ways of existence is the way I'd look at that, aren't clear. They're dim. They're undetermined. Life, as we know, of course, is not straightforward and easy. It's not a simple matter of going out and having a bit of fun with a boat. What it leads to is this. Over his thoughts, over, not in his thoughts, over his thoughts, is hanging constantly a darkness, which he's trying to define. Maybe it's solitude, could you call it solitude or blank desertion? Either one of those. But a darkness hung over his thoughts after this. The world is a darker place. His conclusion is darker. And why? Because nature is not what it was at the beginning of the poem. It wasn't just this lovely lake and trees and, you know, the willow tree and everything and the rocky cove and the adventure, you know, what we'd now think of as almost like a famous five type thing of getting down there and, uh, uh, and, and just experiencing being a child. It's not that. That's not nature. Yes, there are those images around. But what is nature really? It's that. Nature is huge and mighty forms. This is the idea, as uh, uh, many of your teachers would have uh, brought up, I thought, of the sublime, right? The idea that the power of nature makes itself known to you and you kind of sit there going, uh, oh, I'm not that important. I always think of it as the thing I went to the Grand Canyon uh, and I literally couldn't speak for like about three minutes when I got there because it just completely overwhelmed me, the size and shape, whatever of it. And it's that kind of a sense that he's getting. These huge and mighty forms move slowly through my mind. They're not like us. They move slowly through the mind by day and they're a trouble to my dreams. Nature is not what it was. Life is not what it seemed. It's a coming of age thing and a very dark one indeed. So I think take that as the heart of your part of your response if you're dealing with the prelude. Now, I'm not going to deal with my last duchess, um, partly because I don't expect it to come up uh, in any way and I can't deal with everything. And I'm not dealing with the charge of light brigade because the idea of um, seeing that at a perceptive level uh, kind of escapes me. Um, it's, you know, it's not much past a primary school poem, is it? Let's be honest. Um, anyway, so I've moved on to exposure. And exposure has got to be a very strong chance of coming up. There's got to be a strong chance. I think it's a kind of poem they fancy they like using. It's not come up yet. Um, it's got to be a possibility. And it's another one like the prelude where, and I've seen many people write about this, they all write about the first 22 lines and then they stop. Because what does everyone want to say about exposure? Ah, the real enemy is the weather. Yes, it is. Absolutely true. They all want to talk about the merciless ice, these winds at night. That's great image. Great, great. Talk about it. Wonderful. Bring it up. But if you stop at line 22, you're halfway through the poem. It's four stanzas in. There are four stanzas to go in a 43-line poem. Okay? The second half of it is massively, 
massively important to the meaning. Now, to get that across, you don't have the lines in front of you. Those first 22 lines are literally the ones that take on the idea of the weather and its power and, you know, the bullets coming past us aren't as deadly as the snow. That, that really powerful idea, you know, where he uses the um, sibilance. Again, Owen, by the way, another poet that uses sound all the time, all the time. Sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence. Very effective. And then to hit it with less deadly than the air that shudders black with snow. Really high impact thing. And it's fantastic at that point. But then, just as the snow, with that wonderful image of the pale flakes with fingering stealth, reaching for our face, feeling around for our faces. So someone's kind of creeping up behind and kind of pulling you back. But they're made of snow. It's like the marshmallow man in Frozen, isn't it? Um, no, it's not at all. Um, it's at that point it turns them snow dazed, goes into sun dozed. If you remember this in the in the poem, they end up being snow dazed, and then within a line it then says they drowse sun dozed. Right? Okay. Up here, link the two things together. The two he uses again a, another Owen thing of taking um, kind of invented phrases because you have know, snow days and sun dozed, uh, very much his own phrasing generally. Um, slightly changing it to, to show a change, a movement in it, because this is what's happening. At this point, they are falling into a daydream or just a full dream. That's what they're doing. They're drowsing off into sleep. And what happens in the sleep, of course, is very important. I do understand that a lot of you will know this already, but um, I'm going to speak about it as though you don't, just so we go through. When they drowse, look at the change immediately. Suddenly, they're littered with blossoms, trickling where the blackbird fusses. This is immediately a different world to the world they've just been in, with the horror of the snow and the wind and the uh, uh, and the dawn attacking them. This is a, you know, this is more like, you know, beautiful nature that we expect. Probably, actually, an image of that field that they're in before the First World War began. Okay, and this is where they've gone in their head to a much more beautiful place, a much more beautiful time. And that leads to this, what I interpret certainly as a daydream. Still a plural daydream, so they're all coming up with the same idea. But where would you go in a daydream when you're in the trenches? Home, where you want to be. And so that's what happens. Their ghosts drag home. Now, many people say the ghosts suggest that they're dead or dying. Well, they're not because it keeps going further on. I get the interpretation. I tend to think of it as the ghosts of ourselves in kind of our, our, our dreams. They drag themselves home. And when they get there, we do have these sunken fires. We do have the warmth that they're lacking and everything. But look at the language. They only glimpse it. They only get a glimpse of it. Why? Because it's all shut up. On them, the doors are closed. See, the point is, in this dream, they go home. And even in their dreams, this is the horror of it, even in their dreams, their own subconscious, they are unable to get home. They are rejected. They are shut out of home. There is no home for them anymore. It's gone back to nature. The innocent mice, the crickets jingling. And again, you know, innocent jingle, you know, you get this sense of uh, a very nice, lighthearted, almost childlike image. Now, it's also possible to suggest that the sunk fires being described as glows, another word he invented, glows with crusted dark red jewels. Uh, I've certainly discussed the interpretation with people before that it's showing you that, you know, fires crusted with dark red jewels suggest it's actually cold anyway. You know, it has been burning and it's not anymore. And that use of jewels, it's something that appears precious, but it's not what they actually want. Yeah, well, lovely if you go with that way. But again, it could just literally be showing the fact it's there and they can't get to it. However you do it, it does change the meaning hugely of what's going on here. They are so trapped in this world they're exposed to that they cannot get home. And then it leads into, first of all, the fact that that rejection means they go back to where they are, which they refers to as their dying. 
and leaves us with this. Probably, I think we got we discussed before the most potentially the most complex stanza of poetry in the entirety of um, uh, the collection. Not least because if you try and take it literally, it's bizarre because there's the 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 negatives and the double negatives and everything that are in there don't make sense since we believe not otherwise can doesn't seem to make sense. So my advice to you is kind of ignore those words. Uh, just think about the idea of it seems to be that they can't believe anymore that kind fires can burn. They can't believe anymore that somewhere suns smile true on children. They can't believe that anymore there's fields and fruit with the sun coming down on them. What used to be the substance of life, God's invincible spring, the nature that God provides for us, all of that, they are actually starting to get afraid for it because the, this doesn't exist for them anymore. What exists? Those trenches, that weather. Everything, everything within there of God's eventual spring seems as though it may not exist anymore because their life has been reduced to that small amount. Now, that's kind of the way I begin to see it. Take it another way. Absolutely, if you wish to, there's plenty of ways of interpreting it, but it follows on definitely from that rejection. But in the end, they end up with their love of God dying. As they say, they're lying out there and it, they, it's almost like, as I see, therefore they were born. This was the reason they were born. That's how it feels to them now. We were born to lie out here in this exposed cold. So. That second half, vital to a really good idea of exposure. Exposure is another one that I really strongly recommend as well, even though it could well come up as a named one, to be ready as one you could choose and use yourself. It goes beautifully with other poems. If Charge of Light Brigade does come up, and it may well do, I'm afraid. Uh, if Charge of Light Brigade does come up and you're sitting there thinking, well, I can't really go beyond, you know, too deep a level on this poem because there is no depth in it. At least you can bring in exposure and use the depth in there. And that can still pull you up to those high marks. Now, the final one I'm going to deal with today is Storm in the Island, which for no good reason, I have no insight uh, beyond anything else. Some very spurious reasoning and everything. For some reason, at this point in time, this is my favourite to come up this summer. I've become convinced in my head, which probably means it's not going to. And you'll probably be very well prepared in Storm in the Island. Just don't start talking about Ireland. Seriously, as well as the fact it's not there, I'll argue that to the death. Um, as well as that fact, you're almost certainly on Storm in the Island going to be talking about, going to be asked a question if it comes up about the power of nature. So only talk about nature. So. Storm in the Island. What then do I think is interesting? Yeah, the second half of it is absolutely vital, but I'm going to assume that uh, I'm going to take that you're um, you're well prepared on that because that I'm sure you've looked at in depth that whole thing about the wind like a military air attack at the end, that beautiful image of the sea spitting like a tame cat turned savage, you know, something you think is your friend and you can't try. You didn't need to say a tame cat turned savage. You could have just said like a cat, couldn't you? That's cats for you, isn't it, really? I mean, come on. You know, you don't trust cats. Even those of you up here who like cats, you don't trust them, do you? They're their own thing. They're, you know, you think they're your friend, but in the end, a cat's in it for a cat and nothing else, isn't it? So um, that stuff is great. But the bit that a lot of people uh, missed that I think could be very interesting is to ask yourself the question in a 19-line uh, a poem, strange number of lines, in a 19-line poem, why spend over a quarter of the poem talking about something that isn't there? Because it does. But a quarter of a poem talking about something that isn't there. There aren't any trees. And he tells us what the trees would be like, what, what the trees would do for them in the story. Yeah, but they're not there. So why are you talking about them? Yeah, sure, tell us in passing there's no trees here. Like he tells us with the uh, the stacks and stooks of hay, great. But he goes on for ages about it. Why? 
here's the heart of looking at it interestingly, isn't it? Well, first of all, obviously, as he says, the trees, it's the idea of them proving company. It's a bit of personification to a degree, isn't it, of them? Trees is your friends. Oh, I don't blame him. Trees, they're lovely, aren't they? You've got to love a tree. Always makes me feel happy. But anyway, his point being, of course, as it says, when it blows uh, full blast, it, uh, um, they raise a large sound and then you can listen to the thing you fear and forget it pummels your house too. Absolutely. We get the idea, yeah? Right? He's saying if we had trees, we could listen to the sound they make and then we could focus on that and not think about the pummeling of our house and the danger that's coming there. Lovely. Great. But that's a lot to say about something that could be but isn't. So maybe by looking deeper into it, we get there. What about this idea of, oh, I've typed out raise a chorus. And it's a tragic chorus. You can raise a tragic chorus in a gale. Do get that uh, tragic bit in there. It's very, very important. You know about tragic choruses. We could almost be doing one here, couldn't we? It's a bit like a Greek theatre. Yeah. I know you all did it back in year seven. Greek theatre. Because there's a large number of people sat around this room that I did it with. Tragic courses, great theatres. In fact, I actually, I, I seem to remember building, building a uh, um, a Greek theatre in 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 H double O twenty down there, you know, to actually use it. This idea of the amphitheatre of people watching the stage up here with the actors. Remember, in Greek uh, um, tragedy and even comedy, there are only a couple of actors uh, up there for most of the time. When somebody introduced the third actor, it was like you know the world was ending. It was like God, what's happening these days? Um, and then in between is the chorus yeah the chorus this group of people all wear masks still who dance and sing and whatever in between but they can talk to the audience obviously they can't get reply but they can talk to the audience and interpret what's going on stage and comment on what's going on stage but they can also talk to the people on stage as well right so they kind of serve as a middleman between they tell you don't, you know, this is awful. Just imagine how bad this was. They entertain you with songs. They talk to us and say, why are you doing this? And we can actually speak back from up here. And that's what he's placing the trees in. The role of a chorus, a middle ground. So maybe the point behind it is to emphasise the distance between the islanders and the storm. The distance that there is between these two things and therefore the intense danger and alienation there is between them and lamenting the fact that what's missing is that kind of middle ground and it leads into the fact that you could think that the sea would do this job but the sea isn't our friend the sea isn't our chorus it seems like it's a tame cat but then it'll just turn on us like that and we know, know and understand that so maybe that is the central idea to it. Blowing full blast. The violence and the bit in between it. And I include this last line because I often think this one here, but there are no trees, no natural shelter. Maybe it's also leading to that line. My note next to it in my anthology when that line is, well, why are you there then? Is that not what that line's supposed to make us think? Or does make us think, but there are no trees, no natural shelter. Well, why are you living there then? But then maybe that leads us in to one of the things about Storm in the Island. Is Storm in the Island not potentially a celebration of the harlotry of humans, of the of the way humans can deal with things and put up with things? The fact we do go and live in bizarre places. But we survive because we become one with nature. We learn what nature is like. We respect it. Maybe that's partially what's going on here. So. Whoops. I don't even know why that's up several times. Yeah, so that last line is maybe the clue to everything here. So. To remind you. Ozymandias. Think about the power of the artist. London, think about the impact of the sound. The prelude, make sure you focus in on the ending and the impact of that ending. 
Exposure, the second half of the poem. The impact of that going on there. And Storm in the Island, consider that strange second quarter about the trees and the impact of it. Next week, I'll take you from bayonet charge through to the end. And no, I will not be talking about tissue. I don't want to waste my time with that. Right. Thank you all very much.